In this video, we'll be looking at the topic of evolution. There's obviously lots of detail to discuss and understand, but we'll be looking at the first point, which is number nine in your files, which is the origin of an idea about origin. So that's quite a mouthful. But basically, it just tries to understand, we need to understand where this idea of evolution comes from. Who came up with the idea first? Why do they say what they say? So keep in mind that the origin of an idea about origins is really the, any theory or story that tries to explain how we came into existence. Now the most well-known explanation is the theory of evolution. So as I said, evolution is only one of those theories that attempts to explain the origin of life. And when we talk about evolution, I'm sure you're very familiar with this picture that looks like a little ape or a chimp changes over time into a human. Now, although this is what um, movies and the media display evolution as being, this is not really what the theory of evolution says. In actual fact, the theory of evolution claims that all life on Earth originated from single cells which started to cooperate together to form simple multicellular organisms, which then worked together um, to form complex multicellular organisms. This process continued until we eventually saw the rise of ape-like organisms, which eventually evolved into humans. So humans didn't evolve directly from chimps or from apes, but from ape-like organisms. Very important to, to remember the difference there. According to the Subject Assessment Guidelines of the IEB, in this chapter, the origin about an idea about origins, there are seven things that you need to understand. And for the first three questions, we kind of have to look back at what we did in grade 10 and 11. In grade 10, we already learned that evolution can be defined as the change of a population of a species into another species over a period of time. But what does the term species mean? In case you forgot, again in grade 10 we learned that a species is a group of organis organisms with the same chromosome number that is able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Remember we, we also looked at a population which is a group of the same species living together in an area. So evolution is really when that population of that specific species changes chromosome number in such a way that they can't interbreed or have fertile offspring with other organisms, even if they're similar to them, but if the chromosome number is different, they won't be able to interbreed together, which means they weren't the same species. Now we know that evolution is called a theory, but why is it a theory versus a hypothesis? So let me give you this story. Imagine you get home and in the kitchen, in your house, you find that there's some glass, broken glass with blood splatter on it. And you're wondering, obviously, what happened. Now, you might have a story thinking, mm, perhaps my mother wanted to cook and she picked up a glass to fill it with water or whatever and she dropped it and in the process of trying to pick up the broken pieces she cut herself okay then your brother comes in and he decides mm, no 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 he thinks there was an argument between your mom and your dad and your mother threw the glass at your dad and that's why he was cut and the glass is broken so obviously you get from this story that the evidence the facts um, speaks for themselves there are indeed pieces of glass on the floor with blood on. But the explanation of what happened, that's a theory. So you can have a theory of what happened. Your dad can have a theory. Your brother can have a theory. Everybody is trying to explain the fact that there is blood and glass on the floor. So a theory is, in other words an idea or a set of ideas that is intended to explain facts or event. A suggested idea presented as possibly true, but that it's not known or proven to be true. 
And the most important thing about a theory is that you cannot prove it scientifically. So this is where a hypothesis comes in. A hypothesis, on the other hand, would be a statement that can be tested by scientific research. So if you want to test the relationship between two or more things, you need to write a hypothesis. And then you do an experiment so you can collect some data to explain what you've seen in the experiment. We learn this and practice this every time we do an experiment. And perhaps this looks familiar, the scientific method. Which starts off by you asking a question, doing a bit of research, background research on the topic, and then constructing a hypothesis. After that, you're going to go out and test your hypothesis during the experiment, collect some data, and then draw conclusion. So obviously, evolution cannot be done following the scientific method, which means it cannot be a hypothesis. It's therefore called a theory. But remember, with the scenario uh, of the glass broken and the blood splatter, we know that every theory is based on some facts. So let's look at what factual evidence there is or exists to back up the theory of evolution. There are different lines of evidence from which the theory of evolution emerges. And you'll notice that on this list, some of these we've already looked at in grade 10 and 11, and even earlier in this year when we did genetics. So these include the fossil record, modification by descent, biogeography, genetics, and then some others. So look at, let's look at them one by one. The fossil record actually serves as um, evidence for evolution. Now remember in grade 10 we already learned about fossils and perhaps just to revise quickly, can you remember how fossils are formed? They're obviously formed in many different ways but the most common way is when a plant or an animal dies in a watery environment and then gets buried in mud, in mud or silt. So the soft tissues will quickly decompose, but the hard bones or the shells stay behind. And over time, sediment builds up over and on top of this and then hardens into rock. Eventually, the skeleton itself will also become rock, which is called fossilization. Now, when we find this skeleton that is fossilized, it gives us an idea of what the animal looked like or the plant looked like and even when it existed. So the fossil record we find um, inside what we call the geological column. In other words, layers of rock in which the fossils are trapped. You can do a simple experiment at home to actually figure out or to show how these various layers in the geological column has formed. If you take a plastic bottle and you fill it up with some soil, just scoop up some dirt so it looks like this. And then you pour some water into the bottle, put the lid on and shake it up so it looks like this. If you now let the bottle stand for a while, the silt or the muddy water inside is going to separate into specific layers as you can see here after a while. So in the same way, if you've got a watery environment and then animals die inside that watery environment and they get trapped in that slush up muddy water, the bodies are going to be trapped in the various layers. So the fossil record that is trapped within the geological column is used to show three things. The different fossils are found in different layers based on how old they are. So the oldest fossils are found obviously in the oldest layers um, and this suggests also the order in which evolution occurred because you can find the most simple organisms very deep and more towards the top the more recent fossils. Now besides the fossil record evolutionists also uses a phenomenon called modification by descent as proof of evolution or as evidence of evolution. Now what that means, modification by descent, is if we look at living or even fossilized remains of any animal that had a pentadactyl limb, it seems that they all have the same basic bones. 
Now in this picture, we're comparing the arm of a monkey, the flipper of a whale, a pig's front leg, and the wing of a bird. Now the bones inside these four structures are color coded. They are homologue structures. This means that they have similar structure, but they've got different functions. So if you look at them a little bit more closely, you can actually see that there is an upper arm or a humerus in all four. There is an ulna and a radius in all four. And there are fingers in all four. They are just different lengths and sometimes the bones are fused. But in a monkey's arm, a whale's flipper, um, a pig's front leg and a bird's wing, they are the same bones. They are just modified to perform different functions. Now this shows that these four organisms had a common ancestor which had these similar bones. Biogeography is the third area used to gather information and provide factual evidence for evolution. Now biogeography is the study of existing and extinct species to show how closely related species usually occur in the same geographical area. And this suggests that they have a common ancestor. Now, if we look at this image a little bit closer, it looks like when you take an atlas and you cut out all the various continents and then you, you paste them together like the pieces of a puzzle, you'll notice that they kind of fit together. Now, you've studied about this probably in geography or somewhere in grade 8 and 9, where it is believed that all the continents used to be together, fitting nicely into one huge piece of land called Pangaea. What's even more interesting is that archaeologists and paleontologists, if they go digging, they actually find fossils on the east coast of South America that are similar in appearance to the fossils found currently on the west coast of Africa. And that kind of shows that those two areas were once connected and in that similar environment, these organisms evolved the same way. Earlier in the year, we learned about genetics and we know that closely related organisms have similar DNA. Now, evolutionists uses this as your fourth set of um, effects for evolution because it can show how changes in a genotype can actually be transferred to successive generations. In the same way that we learned about mitochondrial DNA showing relatedness or who's the daddy or who did the murder, we can actually look at fossils, um, frozen fossils like the mammoths, and compare their DNA to living modern elephants and notice that they share a common ancestor. Now, sadly, bones that have fossilized are now rock. There's no DNA in those. So we can't go into bony fossils that's hardened into rock and do DNA testing. There are other types of evidence as well that is used to show evolution or to claim evolution, but they're not always very strong and, and sometimes it's questionable. One of those things that can be used is called um, the presence of vestigial organs. Now, a vestigial organ is actually an organ found inside the human body or an animal body that has no apparent function. That is just evidence of an organ inherited from an ancestor that used to be able to use that organ. On the picture on the left hand side, for example, you can see an x-ray of a human, but this person has a tail. In other words, in a normal human being, the sacrum will just be like a triangular bone at the bottom end of the vertebral column. And it ends in a very small little bone, triangular bone called the coccyx. However, in this person, you see that both the sacrum and the coccyx are subdivided into different little bones. On the right hand side, there's an x-ray of a human mouth showing the position of the wisdom teeth. Now, wisdom teeth are also considered vestigial organs. Our ancestors apparently used to be much larger than us, having big mouths, big skulls, 
being rougher and stronger than us, needing that eighth tooth um, in every quadrant of the mouth. However, these days, because we eat more refined food, our skeletons are becoming smaller. And therefore, we don't need that um, wisdom tooth anymore. So it doesn't actually have a f function. Embryology can also be used to study evolution. Now, many, many years ago, a scientist called Haeckel made these drawings of the embryos of various organisms, claiming that at a certain stage of development, they all look exactly the same, which means that they all came from an original common ancestor. His theory was widely accepted until about 50 years later when somebody actually broke open some eggs and dissected some embryos to find that no, it does not indeed look like the pictures he drew. It looks like the second line of pictures. The embryos don't look exactly the same. Evolutionists do however say that if we study embryos, each individual embryo, the stages that that embryo goes through, shows the evolutionary changes our common ancestors went through up to where we are now. So it's not the strongest evidence, but some evolutionists still look at embryos to study evolution.